Chapter 22. Uh, chapter two, 22 covers neurologic disorders or basically um, issues of the nervous system. Um, and these tend to have a few dramatic and uh, really potentially life-threatening emergencies that come up. Um, things such as strokes and seizures uh, tend to uh, be the, uh, the majority of what we, we cover in this chapter. However, there's a a few others uh, throughout this this section that are probably fairly dramatic, um, not nearly as life threatening, but certainly have the potential to be uh, life altering. So, uh, as with all of our chapters, simply listening and watching the lecture uh, does not should not take the place of reading and studying the chapters. So you should, at your earliest convenience, do that. The AEMT will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic and selected advanced emergency care and transportation based on the assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. There's a uh, multimedia video on TIAs that you can watch in the non-narrated non version. Our objectives, there's actually quite a few objectives for this chapter that can be found on 464 through 466. All right, so neurologic disorders arise in either the central or the peripheral nervous system. So we have uh, obviously the two uh, significant divisions uh, of the central or, or of the uh, nervous system in general. Remember, some of these can be further broken down, and we'll uh, kind of recap that um, in a few slides here. But Nervous system uh, issues generally cause alterations in mental status, occasionally behavioral changes, and then some other kind of dramatic neurologic deficits, such as inability to use certain body parts, pupil dilation, and so on and so forth. So by understanding the pathophysiology of the disease process, it helps us understand the importance of our actions, and we know that in several of these cases that uh, time is really truly of the essence so we need to be able to uh, scoot along when we're uh, picking up a patient particularly to say that ha has stroke-like symptoms because uh, their window of, of opportunity to receive uh, potentially nearly completely reversing uh, treatment uh, is very 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 small that goes with your case study So the nervous system and the endocrine system are the two major communicative or uh, control systems of the body. They're the ones that kind of dispatch out certain information uh, via their, their respective mechanisms, the nervous system, via the process of conducting it down uh, the uh, quote-unquote phone lines of the nervous system, uh, whereas with the endocrine system, it's by secreting those hormones, and those hormones spread through the blood to uh, send more uh, information. So, the central nervous system is divided uh, into the brain, or I'm sorry, the nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, which is uh, remember the brain and the spinal cord, and then the peripheral nervous system, which is all the tissue outside the brain. The nervous system is then further divided into <coughs> the somatic and the autonomic divisions. So the somatic being voluntary, the autonomic being automatic or involuntary divisions of the nervous system. So obviously some things work behind the scenes without us having to put really any effort or thought into it. Where, you know, say we don't have to sit around and think digest, digest, digest. But something like we have to actually can think about getting up and walking across the room. So uh, examples of uh, an involuntary versus a voluntary. The autonomic nervous system uh, is divided into two other significant divisions, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. We've been talking about these all along through class. 
um, from way back early in class, the parasympathetic is our vegetative functions and our reproductive functions. So um, it's our rest and digest, whereas our sympathetic is our response to stress. So that's our fight or flight. So when, you know, the very first time the pager went off, when you went on your very first ambulance call, you, uh, you had an up close and personal um, experience with the sympathetic nervous system. <clears throat> so the functions of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic divisions, uh, when we're looking at the sympathetic, we're often talking about several of the adrenergic receptors. Um, and here's the, here, here are the major players in that. Uh, we have alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 being the major players in the sympathetic side of things. Alpha-1 constricts the arterioles and veins and causes pupil dilation. And when it constricts those arterioles and veins, it's usually out towards the periphery, around the edges of our body, so the things that are less important. Not that it doesn't cause constriction elsewhere, but that's where its biggest influence is. Beta 1 versus beta 2. We remember a while back we've also talked about these, these topics. Um, remember we have one heart, we have two lungs, uh, and beta, is, beta 1 has to do with the heart. Beta 2 has to do primarily with the lungs. Beta 1 increases the heart rate, strength of contraction, automaticity, and the conduction. So it really, that's the one that makes our heart flutter like it's going to beat out of our chest when, when we're really super uh, psyched up. Beta 2 causes the bronchodilation, dilation of arterioles, primarily peripherally. Um, the inhibition, uh, I'm sorry, primarily centrally, uh, so cl closer to the center of the body. Uh, inhibition of the uterine contractions which doesn't have much that we're, we're really talking about uh, in most cases for uh, adults and whatnot, but uh, occasionally we actually will use that to our advantage with some of the medications to help uh, control labor. Um, and then skeletal muscle tremors, so it causes you to kind of get a little, uh, little nervous, a little psyched up. Parasympathetic wise, uh, we have pupil constriction, a decrease in the heart rate, strength and the, and the strength of contraction and the blood pressure causes a little bronchoconstriction uh, and it increases the gastrointestinal tract activity. So in many cases when we have parasympathetic nervous uh, stimulation we tend to get a little bit uh, uh, in, in a secretion mode where more more fluids are flowing uh, in our our body. So we might have uh, salivation or lacrimation or urination, so a variety of things that can certainly uh, make the fluids flow. Whereas we're in the sympathetic uh, stimulation, we tend to see more of the conservation <coughs> of uh, fluids, so we don't tend to see as much of it being um, ejected from the body. The function of the nervous system is several fold. Number one, it monitors input from the body's internal and external environments. So it watches things like you know, blood pressures and CO2 levels, it detects things like pain, um, heat, cold. It integrates that sensory input from the environment and starts to um, make appropriate changes so the body can deal with that external environment. And then coordinates both voluntary and involuntary responses to input. So you know whether we get cold and decide we better go put a jacket on, um, that would be voluntary, or things like cause uh, some vasoconstriction to you know keep the uh, the cold environment um, you know, out and uh, try to conserve serve heat on the uh, the inner environment. So here's an example of, of a neuron. Um, the dendrites, or the kind of fingerling things that uh, are fanned out there, kind of looks like a tree, top of a tree. Um, 
those dendrites are where signals are picked up. So from the preceding neuron, uh, the dendrites can gain the information from the preceding neuron's terminal. Um, there's the body of the neuron, which is kind of the processing center, and you can see that the, the major organelles are there, so the nucleus and whatnot. Uh, it then feeds the information down the axon, down to the terminal, and then the terminal um, will pass it on to the next item. And what I say item because in this picture, they show that it's actually going to pass its signal on to um, to a muscle. Okay, so this one is uh, coming in contact with the muscle. However, in, in many cases, it's just passing it on to the next nerve in the system or in the chain. So, um, regardless of the uh, whatever the next structure is, uh, the message has to travel across what is referred to as the synapse. Uh, the synapse is the uh, space from between the, pre the preceding neuron and whatever else it's coming into contact with. And within those spaces is where we have the neurotransmitters. So when we talk about the various neurotransmitters of, uh, of acetylcholine or uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, uh, though that's the chemical mediator in that, in that site. So we're going to touch on those here in just a, a minute. <clears throat> so the basic unit uh, of structure of the nervous system is the neuron, and we just covered the components of it. So the gap between that axon and, and the dendrites of the adjacent neuron uh, or effector tissue is the synapse, and those molecules of neurotransmitters secreted into the synapse and bind with receptors uh, on, on the dendrites. So we're going to come back to that here in a second. Here, they're showing an example of the brain. Uh, it's not critical that we, uh, you know, put to memory each and every one of these uh, these parts. Uh, we're going to talk about them here briefly um, after we talk about some neurotransmitters. But uh, so neurotransmitters. Um, acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is is really a very very common, um, probably the probably the most common neurotransmitter um, uh, in both the uh, the preganglionic, uh, which is uh, ganglion is near the near the spinal cord neurotransmitter, um, and then the pre and post neuro uh, postganglionic neurotransmitter in the parasympathetic nervous system. So and this. Uh, also acts at the neuromuscular junction. So acetylcholine is very common. We have a drug that is occasionally given by paramedics or in the hospital called a, a succinylcholine, uh, which is actually uh, goes in and it disrupts the process of acetylcholine being able to do its job in passing things on. So that is the paralytic agent that most services and, and many uh, uh, anesthetists use for the purpose of paralyzing somebody to intubate them because it goes in there and it messes up that whole process. It doesn't allow something to break down and be, be reabsorbed and, and put back into circulation. Dopamine uh, in the brain, uh, it is primarily uh, found in the brain. It is uh, It affects items such as movement, emotions, uh, and then uh, the experience of pleasure. And uh, it also may have some roles in addictions. Uh, and death of dopamine producing cells is what causes Parkinson's disease. So um, a lot of, and, and, and kind of, if you go back and look at this a little bit, where it's responsible for movement, emotions, and the experience of pleasure, um, if you know somebody who has some fairly advanced Parkinson's disease, you know, they kind of have a shuffling gait in this kind of just deadpan face where they don't really show much emotion. They're really kind of monotone. I think that kind of goes in it. Uh, it plays right into that. You can see that. Some of the antipsychotic agents that we're using um, decreases that dopamine activity. Um, 
and it can be used to treat schizophrenia because you know people with schizophrenia usually are running a million miles an hour. And then some of the older antidepressants uh, block the enzyme that breaks down dopamine and it increases the dopamine's action within the brain. Well, so that may be beneficial to somebody, say, with Parkinson's disease. People who have Parkinson's usually will end up on a replacement uh, medication, levodopa, carbidopa, uh, those sorts of, of drugs that uh, will help you uh, kind of conserve some of that and, and maintain some of your mental faculties. GABA, which is uh, gamma aminobutyric acid, uh, it inhibits the central nervous system activity and its deficiency uh, can play a big role in anxiety and insomnia, so people who can't shut off. So benzodiazepines such as Valium or Xanax uh, will then decrease anxiety by, by stimulating the GABA receptors. So remember, GABA inhibits. People who don't have enough GABA will be a little, uh, a little on, on edge. Glutamate it plays a role in learning and memory. Um, Alzheimer's disease has been shown to possibly have some issues with, uh, with glutamate deficiency. Uh, it's also seen in alcoholic brain damage. Uh, norepinephrine, we've talked about that quite a bit. It helps uh, helps in the RAS, so the reticular activating system, which the RAS is what keeps you awake when you're drinking uh, caffeinated beverages. Caffeine goes to work uh, at the RAS and doesn't allow it to shut down. Um, and then excesses uh, in the amygdala and the forebrain can produce anxiety. So there's a, a large number of the uh, first-line antidepressants and, and uh anti-anxiety agents today that are um, norepinephrine inhibitors. So it keeps them from reuptaking that, uh, that norepi. And then serotonin is the other very, very common class of uh, antidepressant drugs. Uh, in the brain, serotonin is, is responsible for mood, appetite, uh, emotion, and sleep. Um, so people who take melatonin are kind of supplementing that. Uh, and it's responsible for your general feelings of, of well-being. So it's kind of our feel-good drug, or feel-good uh, uh, neurotransmitter. Um, and then that lack of serotonin can lead to some depressions. It also causes you to not have uh, good sleep cycles. And uh, so a lot of our drugs, uh, people are on today, like I said, are, are SSRIs, or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, there's the SNRI class for the select nor norepi reuptake inhibitors. <clears throat> so our human brain has six major parts. Uh, the cerebrum, diencephalon, midbrain, pons, medulla, or the medulla oblongata, and uh, the cerebellum. So we'll touch briefly on those parts. The cerebrum is the uppermost portion of the brain. It's responsible for the higher brain functions. That's the parts divided into right and left halves. And each of those um, parts uh, have the uh, various lobes or subparts that uh, go along with it. And the uh, we have the frontal lobe, which is uh, aptly and appropriately named uh, because it covers the front portion of the brain. So we have the parietal lobe, which is on the side and towards the top. So the top and side, top sides, or I should say maybe the top middle would be a better way to put that. Um, the parietal lobe. We have the lateral, uh, I'm sorry, temporal, the temporal on the lateral side, uh, the temporal lobe of the brain, uh, which is basically the the sides, lower sides, and then the occipital uh, in the back. So each of those kind of have their own uh, part. We're going to get to those here in just a second. <clears throat> so frontal lobes have to do with cognition, thinking, problem solving, reasoning, uh, learning, judging, intelligence, personality. So a lot of what makes us human really is in our frontal lobe. Um, we have the uh, 
um, people who used to get lobotomies where they would actually take some sort of a device, a stick or whatnot, shove it up their nose, break through their uh, cribriform plate, which is, separates the, the nose from the, the cranium. Um, and then they basically kind of rattle it around, scramble the brain up in there. And it caused these people to be basically like walking zombies. So um, they weren't really able to, to have uh, any emotion. Uh, their, their thinking abilities were pretty well gone. They didn't have much reason. There was really no personality left. For the temporal lobe uh, on the sides of your brain, basically right above your ears, um, the uh, has to do with hearing and then somewhat with your uh, visual memory. Parietal, above those temporal lobes at the top, these really have to do a lot with your um, kinesthetic sense, your balances, your interpretation of some of the senses, and written language skills, um, touch, and then your uh, kind of your um, voluntary movements of your body parts. So, occipital lobe is really mostly visual, whoops, mostly visual, and uh, has to do with uh, interpreting what your eyes are actually seeing, putting it into, into uh, terms that you can, um, <clears throat> terms that you can actually make sense of. So, Cerebellum, that's the part that hangs off the back of the brain, um, and uh, it's the little ball shape on the back, bottom back of the brain. Um, it is responsible for your fine motor movements, your coordination, your balance, and your posture. So cerebellum has a lot to do with how we walk upright and erect. The medulla oblongata, which the medulla oblongata is... Um, part of the brain stem, so right up inside the foramen magnum, which is the, uh, the hole in the bottom of the skull there where the spinal cord comes out. Uh, this is responsible for the regulation of breathing, cardiovascular, so our vegetative and vital functions. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, it relays that information between the brain's higher centers and the spinal cord uh, to control skeletal movement. And then it relays, uh, I'm sorry, the pons then, uh, which is the next, next notch up on the spinal cord as it comes to the brain. Um, it relays information from the higher brain centers and the spinal cord, and it also helps regulate respiration. So between the medulla and the pons, uh, a majority of our respiratory drive is right there, right inside the, the front door of the skull. The reticular activating system, or the RAS, kind of tucked up right up in the middle of the brain, um, kind of right up in the, in the midbrain areas. Um, it is uh, nerve fibers within that hypothalamus, thalamus, medulla, pons, midbrain, uh, that does a lot of uh, sensory relay as well as uh, maintains our consciousness, like I've talked about. The amygdala, uh, this is part of the limbic system. Uh, and it has roles in memory formation and emotional reactions. The thalamus, it's a relay center between the cortex and the sense organs, and the hypothalamus. Uh, hypothalamus really is kind of the slave driver of the uh, slave driver of the endocrine system because it passes a lot of messages on to other glands and says, "Hey, do this." <clears throat> if you have a scene size up and there are multiple patients with altered mental status, you should suspect an exposure to a toxin. Okay, well, no, we're not in a to we're not in the toxicological emergencies chapter. We're in the nervous system chapter. But one of the most common things we see with the patients with nervous system issues is alteration in mental status. However, very I don't know that I can even think of anything outside of an infectious disease that is a contagious or you know, something that's going to cause multiple people to have the same signs and symptoms and really in kind of an acute or, or a, a rapid setting. So that should drive your, your thoughts away from 
this being a nervous problem and it being actually a toxicology problem. So don't enter the area. Notify dispatch that you're probably going to need a hazmat team, fire, or whatnot. Um, simply for the fact that <clears throat> there is uh, um, there is the potential for you to become part of the situation as well. So our presentation, our complaints, our history help us determine if the problem is a neurologic cause. So is this something that came on quickly, something that's been coming on slowly? Have they eaten anything? Uh, have they you know, taken any drugs? Uh, or is this something that it just hit them very suddenly and they had uh, this, this major change uh, just in, in, in the snap of a finger? So knowledge of pathophysiology uh, of the common neurologic problems is important. And so that's what we basically will cover here now for the majority of the remainder of the chapter. Uh, the scene size up, we have our, our standard uh, operational things that we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at our patient care issues as well, so our BSIs. And, you know, do we need to make sure that it's safe for us to be in there? Do we need to call for additional help? Maybe it's our system is set up if we have a, uh, a probable stroke that we uh, dispatch the paramedics. Maybe our paramedics uh, have uh, some advanced things they're doing and uh, can deliver certain drugs to uh, get the process rolling. Um, note the indication that the problem is neurologic. Is it things that have to do with cognition, with their mental status, things that has to do with um, their motor function on particularly one side of the body or the other? And then note their general appearance and obtain their chief complaint. If they're unresponsive, check for a crowded pulse and start our cardiac resuscitation. Yes, it may be a neurologic issue, but uh, we're probably going to have to make that sit back seat because resuscitation is going to take priority. We need to get that patient, um, get oxygenation going through them and uh, blood pumping to get their uh, brain appropriately perfused. Some patients with neurologic problems will be very deeply unresponsive and that's going to lead us to airway obstruction and decreased ventilation. Uh, I'll give you a primary example of that. People with hemorrhagic strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes for some reason have, uh, well not for some reason, for good reason, uh, hemorrhagic strokes uh, have deeply unconscious states that they're in. Usually they started out with a severe headache, said hey I'm going to go lay down and rest try to get rid of this headache and they don't wake back up and then they end up with snoring respirations because they have gone so far down uh, and then neurologically they're not able to control their own tissues. <clears throat> so intervene as necessary. Start with your basic airway maneuvers. Suctioning as need be. A lot of people say with that uh, hemorrhagic stroke will vomit and vomit severely. So airway control, oxygenation, so we need to make sure that they're oxygenated well. If we're over oxygenating them, remember though we can actually cause some harm. So if if we have way too much oxygen on them, we're bagging them at 25 liters per minute, we're bagging them 40 times a minute on an adult, um, we're not doing them any favors. We're actually causing them to constrict their vessels in their brain and that in turn is going to cause them to have hypoxia to their brain. Um, impaired brain oxygenation worsens the outcome for neurologic patients, but that's, remember, a double-edged sword. And then limit secondary brain injury from poor perfusion, hypoxia, and hypoglycemia. Some of those things, we, we have some things we can do. If they're poorly perfused, we can try to give them some fluids. If they're hypoxic, we give them some more too. They're hypoglycemic, we give them some sugar. So now, uh, people would look and say, well, you know, we have a, a good example of deeply unresponsive people might be our diabetic reactions. Well, very true. Uh, it's not a neurologic problem, but it gives a neuro neurologic um, presentation because people will, will say, oh, well, they're deeply unresponsive. It's got to be a nervous problem. Well, it's a nervous problem simply because the nervous system doesn't have enough sugar. <laughs> 
obtaining your history, samples, and OPQRST, lists of medications. I have a handful of, of uh, literally a fraction of the medications that people with neurologic issues might be on. Um, there's a number of, of antidepressant or antipsychotic medications in here, such as amitriptyline, uh, chlorpromazine, haloperidol. Those are, are fairly common with people with psychological issues, whether they're an anxiety problem or a depression problem. Uh, could it potentially be bipolar or schizophrenia? Um, some of them have alternative uses, though, things like migraine pain or migraine control um, used for insomnia. We have a few for the long, long-term um, dementia creating problems. So, uh, denezepil, which is Aricept, uh, or I'm sorry, denepazil, uh, and uh, levodopa for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, respectively. Things such as meclizine, which is given for dizziness or vertigo. Uh, a couple of anti-seizure medications such as uh, gabapentin. Uh, phenytoin, uh, those are, are both uh, major seizure ones. Uh, carbamazepine or Tegretol is another one. Uh, they don't even have on here like Versed or Valium. Uh, Versed is usually given host in, in a healthcare setting, but uh, people are on Valium um, regularly at home or Xanax um, um, for that matter. A few others for different types of migraines, whether it's propranolol, which is a beta blocker, sumatriptan, which is imitrax, uh, for migraines. Uh, valproic acid down there at the bottom, it's kind of a multi-purpose, migraines and seizures. There are tons and tons and tons of neuro meds. So again, having a good uh, medication resource uh, can be a lifesaver when you're trying to uh, look some of these up and see what, what the patient's got for a, a history. Okay, our secondary assessment. Uh, we have to obtain vital signs, of course, pulse oximetry. Blood glucose. Um, I think this is a good point in which to reemphasize this. If we didn't get this out of the endocrine chapter, uh, getting it out of this chapter, anytime we have a patient with altered mental status or a history of diabetes, we should be checking their blood glucose. Otherwise, th it, there is no sense in checking their blood glucose unless we have some really, really strong suspicion one way or another that this is maybe a blood sugar problem or issue. So we've learned about how people with hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia look. Um, there are people that are under the, uh, the impression that, well, we should just take a blood glucose on everybody because it's a vital sign. Well, number one, it's not a vital sign. Number two, that's not the way that advanced EMS works. Uh, we use clinical decision making. We use common sense and reason to do these things. They, when you go into the hospital, they do not run every test under the sun just because they can. They do not run, give everybody a CT and an MRI every blood test and run every urine test and do a spinal tap and, and, and. That's just not the way that the system works. That's not efficient and, and that's frankly um, ignorant to do it that way. So blood glucose is on people with altered mental status or diabetes. Consider the possibility of increased intracranial pressure. We have increased intracranial pressure. Um, then that puts obviously increased pressure on the brain tissue itself. So when we're talking increased intracranial pressure, we tend to have a few things that we will see in the patient, such as we will start to see blood pressures increase, pulse rates drop, and respirations as well drop and become erratic in most cases. Um, those three things together are referred to as Cushing's triad. You may also see um, something uh, referred to as, as uh, Cushing's reflex is when we have an a, uh, uh, increase in the blood pressure accompanied by a bradycardia. 
So that's Cushing's reflex. Um, but Cushing's triad was when we add uh, the irregularity uh, of the respiratory drive and pattern. Uh, and those are all kind of hallmark signs of uh, Cushing's, uh, or I'm sorry, of an uh, increase in intracranial pressure. So, um, the cerebral perfusion pressure, it's not something we can check, but it's only a concept we can kind of keep in mind. When we think about their mean arterial pressure, which we've learned about in the cardiovascular chapter, um, when we uh, learned about that, they have to have a significant mean arterial pressure above that of the cerebral perfusion pressure in order for blood to actually get in there. So if the pressure within their skull is higher than the pressure than their mean arterial pressure, then blood doesn't actually get to go into the brain. Um, the higher pressure wins. So when we have that uh, higher cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, the body needs a little higher blood pressure to continue to uh, circulate the brain. Otherwise, we need to reduce the intracranial pressure. Ultimately, that's what we need to do is reduce the intracranial pressure so a normal nap will work. So. And then we're going to, of course, have our rapid physical exam for critical patients and our focused physical exam for our non-critical patients. In our secondary, we're going to use a few different types of exams. A lot of it depends on what are some of the standards, uh, the standards of care. These things will change with time. Um, you know, I can tell you 20, 25 years ago, we didn't talk about the Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Scale. And right now, it, it's huge. Uh, right now, it's probably the most commonly used stroke screening device out there. Um, so things like our Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Scale. Maybe your department has opted to choose to use the or has opted to use the uh, Los Angeles Prehospital Stroke Screen. Um, most departments have not. I mean, it does have some good additional information in it, but uh, with the normal clinical reasoning process as well as the simple tool that the Cincinnati Prehospital Stroke Scale is, most people. Um, are opting not to use the LAPS. He's choosing the Cincinnati. So uh, we put this also on top of our Glasgow Coma Scale because the Glasgow Coma Scale is uh, um, still one of the standards. Although it is it is uh, limited because what you have to know is is how were they prior to any incident, and it doesn't leave us a lot of room for people who maybe couldn't talk to begin with. Well, somebody who cannot speak at all um, because of some, you know, they had uh, throat cancer or something and had their, their uh, voice box removed, it, it doesn't allow us to interject in that, that, hey, this person, you know, gets a one in the verbal response category, but they always get a one in the verbal response category. So, uh, that, that's kind of a limitation to it. So knowing how they were prior. The other thing about Glasgow Coma Scale is um, people usually report it in the total number, anywhere from 3 to 15, but that doesn't tell us where is the deficit truly at. Maybe, maybe they get a 10, and that 10 could be between all three, between eye-opening, verbal, and motor, or maybe it's they only got a... Um, a one in motor and got four and five in verbal and I. Slim outside chance that that would happen, but nonetheless, that's quite a bit different than getting, you know, a, a three in eye opening and a, a three in verbal and a four in motor. So it's limited. Oops. Um, and then don't forget to check uh, pupils and CSM in our patients. Pupils can give us a good idea. Now remember, sometimes people always have um, irregular or uh, unequal pupils that can be normal for people, um, as well as may not have full sensory and motor function in all their extremities. 
but we need to check those things. So here's our Cincinnati pre-hospital stroke scale. I call it the drift, droop, and dogs. So we're looking for arm drift, facial droop, and if they can say something like, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. So the facial droop, have the patient look at us, smile, and show us their teeth. Uh, hopefully that doesn't backfire, and they tell us they're in the denture cup over there. But um, have them smile and show us their teeth. We're looking for symmetry on their, on their face. Both sides do the same thing. Arm drift, this is called also the pronator drift test. Have the patients, in general, we prefer to have them stand if they can, um, but uh, put, put their arms straight out in front of them, turn their palms up, close their eyes, and hold for 10 seconds. If they can watch what they're doing. They're not going to let their arm drift or, or turn over. But uh, a person who can't see what they're doing will have a positive sign when their arm either starts to drift down and or their palm flips over where the palm side is now down. And abnormal speech, we have them say something like that everybody in the world has heard millions of times, like you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We're listening for the correct words, slurring of the words. Um, are they in the wrong place? Are they unable to speak completely? They say uh, if you have a patient who exhibits a one positive on the Cincinnati pre stroke scale, uh, they have a approximately 70% likelihood of having a stroke. Two is close to a 90%, and three is almost a guarantee. So, um, There's the LA pre-hospital stroke screen. I'm not going to read this to you because, like I said, it's fairly limited in, in uh, who uses it. And, and to be honest with you, most of this is stuff you gather through your clinical reasoning process anyway. The GCS, we've gone over this before. You need to commit this to memory. Remember, eye-opening is simply avpu, verbal. Are they oriented, disoriented, inappropriate, can't understand what they're saying or nothing, and then motor. Do they follow our commands? Do they localize pain or as we, like, pinch them, do they reach over and try to push our hand away? Do they withdraw from it or simply try to move themselves away? So, you know, if you pinch their arm, do they not try to swat at you but rather move their arm away? Abnormal flexion, when they curl their arms up, curl their neck down, or their chin down towards their chest, extension, where they actually go exactly the other way, and then no response. All right. So things that may help us understand that, hey, there's possibly a neuro issue here. Altered mental status, behavioral emergencies, headaches, slurred speech, uh, loss of motor function. So, if somebody has a loss of motor function, then that could potentially be a. a, a so, some of the things to consider when we're looking at patients with neuro complaints. We have extracranial things versus intracranial things. Most of the intracranial things are really, truly our neurologic problems or, or complaints. It's the extracranial things that can cause... Um, right, so the, the intracranial uh, issues are those that are truly our neurologic complaints. We have these extracranial things that may make it look like a neurologic emergency, but in reality uh, is usually something that uh, is another system that is actually affecting uh, the whole homeostatic process or the homeostatic environment. So extracranial things like infection where we, we've uh, flooded the, the system with toxins, metabolic problems where we have maybe uh, excesses of uh, electrolytes or low sugars, uh, hypoxia, of course, um, that's going to affect the brain, make it look like you know a potential neurologic emergency, but in reality, it's a respiratory or or a, uh, a circulatory problem. Hypoperfusion, same thing. Toxins, like I mentioned. Uh, environmental conditions. Hypothermia, hyperthermia. Just changes that homeostatic environment in which the patient is not able to to uh, um, survive in that uh, in in its ideal zone there. Intracranially, things like brain injuries, strokes, epilepsies, tumors, that sort of thing um, tend to, to cause true neurologic issues. 
AEIOU tips. It's a great little mnemonic that uh, you can use to uh, help remind you of some of the reasons why people have altered mental status. Not exclusive to neurologic problems, but all potential things that can cause neurologic deficit. So, um, at least in in the time in a short time span. Um, our reasoning and decision making. Uh, still, it's supportive things first. The basics, ABCs, controlling blood, bleeding, blood pressure, so on and so forth. Um, transporting stroke or trauma patients to the appropriate facility for care. So if we have the ability to bypass one hospital to go to a trauma center, bypass one hospital to go to a stroke center, um, we should be considering that. We should be building that into our system and into our protocol. Yes, it might take us longer to get back home and get back to bed from that call at 3 o'clock in the morning. But remember, we're here to do the right thing for the patient. If you're, if you're truly here having uh, a fit because your call took an extra 10 minutes because of the way you had to transport your patient, um, you perhaps are not here for the right reason. Reassessment again, 5 and 15, depending on their criticality. Patients with altered mental status, behavioral changes, sensory impairments, headaches, weakness, paralysis, and other complaints, those are all things that should drive us toward a potential neurologic emergency. Um, whereas we might, be, um, we might be headed down the wrong path initially, but it helps us narrow our, um, it helps us narrow down our, our possibilities or our differential diagnoses. All right, altered mental status. Altered mental status is not a disease. It's not a condi it is a condition, but it is not a diagnosis. Um, it's not definitive. Altered mental status is more like a bucket or a category. Okay, uh, altered mental status is this, the the symptom or the sign. I guess it would be the sign. We we note it. Usually the patient doesn't note it, so it wouldn't be a symptom. Uh, it's usually the sign uh, that something's going on, but it isn't why it's going on. So <clears throat> the patient becomes very vulnerable to a lot of things. You can have altered mental status, you may make poor judgment calls, you may have um, losses of reflexes including your gag reflex, so your, your airway is in danger. Um, again, it's maintaining ABCs and then looking for those correctable uh, underlying causes. Going back to that AEIOU tips uh, mnemonic that we had can be uh, can be very beneficial in helping us starting to look for the potential um, correctable cause. So if they lose their gag reflex, they lose control of their muscle uh, that uh, controls their, their tongue and their throat, their respirations can be depressed, they can get that snoring respiration, um, they can vomit and, uh, and aspirate. Uh, patients with involvement of the hypothalamus and the brainstem, they may be it may lose their vegetative function. So, temperature control, blood pressure, heart rate, respirations, um, those you know being the four vital signs. Um, if we lose those because of the involvement, so you have a, a stroke or or an injury uh, to that part of the brain, uh, they lose all their vegetative function. So it's you know the, the people we talk about being essentially comatose for the rest of their life, but uh, uh, continuing to uh, survive with the help of technology uh, usually have this intact hypothalamus and brain stem. But it's the upper upper levels of their brain where their normal human function, you know, that makes us humans, uh, is the part that's damaged or destroyed. Syncope. <laughs> Syncope is the temporary loss of consciousness due to inadequate brain perfusion. Remember that the uh, uh, patients or the lay people refer to this as passing out or fainting. Uh, and that's what, uh, what syncope is. Most of the time it's very, very short uh, term where the patient has a uh, um, 
syncopal episode or maybe even a near syncopal episode where they get up too quick and kind of feel like they're going to pass out. But they'll have the syncopal episode um, and usually within seconds to a minute or two from hitting the floor, they uh, are starting to come to already. The, the first thing you should consider in a syncopal episode is that it be of cardiac origin or cardiac nature. Something in the cardiovascular system is caused this. And it's probably a cardiac dysrhythmia. However, it could be that the patient um, is either hypovolemic in a true sense or relatively, say, from the person that maybe has a, uh, a sepsis where they're actually in a distributive shock, their, um, their vessels are too large to uh, manage the volume that they actually have. Certain medications, so say somebody is on a uh, beta blocker, uh, which is helping to uh, uh, keep their heart rate a little lower, but yet they need their heart rate to get up there to help uh, because they're, they're having a, an adrenaline rush for, for whatever reason. Um, so they need their heart rate to, to bump back up there. The uh, beta blocker keeps that from happening. They don't have enough perfusion to keep them going, and out they go. Uh, vasovagal response, fairly common. Patients uh, are in on the toilet and uh, going to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, going to have a bowel movement. They go to bear down, and uh, next thing you know, they're uh, they're passing out on the toilet. The underlying cause of syncope in most cases, like I said, is cardiovascular, not neurologic. Syncope is usually transient, comes, goes, it's gone, uh, and there's really not much, um, not much after effect. Usually, the the only signs that we have left by the time we even get there uh, of the syncopal uh, episode is actually things that are secondary to their syncope. So they passed out walking into the bathroom. Uh, fell, hit their head on something. But probably when we put a cardiac monitor on, when we take vital signs, we're not going to come up with anything. Everything's going to look pretty normal. So um, syncope can be benign. Um, it has those potentials, though, for it to be a life-threatening cause. So if somebody's having this transient um, idiopathic arrhythmia or dysrhythmia uh, where their heart is not keeping up with... Uh, what their needs are, then they are uh, uh, they have the potential uh, for this to come back and strike at another time, be bigger and, and badder, and be uh, you know potentially fatal. So syncope patients should be encouraged to be transported to the hospital. They should be encouraged to be evaluated, worked up, looked over. Um, they're going to run lab work and whatnot. So. All right, and then don't forget when we're talking about syncopes that patients also have that chance of uh, or possibility of secondary injuries, uh, say if they fall um, during the syncopal episode. So highly, 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 strongly suggest that people be transported uh, to the hospital should they have a syncopal episode. It is not normal. Sometimes it is a, a quick, easy fix or, or a very simple explanation or cause, but with the the rule of thumb we have in EMS that syncope is cardiac in nature until proven otherwise. Um, we really should uh, highly encourage people for a further evaluation. Stroke. Uh, stroke is a one of the leading causes of death and disability uh, in the United States. It's when an area of the brain is deprived of circulation or it is not perfused, so therefore it doesn't get the oxygen and glucose that it needs. Um, Ischemic strokes versus hemorrhagic strokes, it's the two major families of strokes. The ischemic stroke is when we have arterial flow that is stopped due to some sort of a blockage, whereas hemorrhagic, we have a, essentially an aneurysm 
a rupture of a vessel uh, within the cranium causing bleeding. So the bleeding actually stops, uh, so the, the blood flow stops because it's all leaking out into the brain tissue. Uh, it doesn't get past the point in which the, the rupture is. Not to mention the, uh, the uh, extra pressure being placed on the brain tissue by uh, the bleeding inside the skull. Remember the skull doesn't give well so therefore um, it puts all of its pressure in onto the brain itself. Um, hemorrhagic strokes are in, in most cases devastatingly debilitating if not fatal and a lot of them actually probably a majority of them are fatal. Uh, ischemic strokes don't tend to be as fatal as often unless they're massive, uh, but they certainly um, have a lot of debilitating effects that, that have lasting, uh, lasting effects. So that ischemic stroke usually is from uh, artery disease, atherosclerosis. Uh, typically the internal carotid arteries are the ones that are looked at as being uh, some of the, the main offenders people will have something called an endarterectomy done where they'll actually go in on one side, they'll open up the carotid artery, scrape out the plaque, so it back up, um, and then probably you know, several weeks to a month later may have it done on the other side in order to improve blood flow to their brain. So if you note, note, note these scars that go the entire length of where you put your fingers to check their carotid pulse, uh, that's probably what they had, had done was an endarterectomy. The risk factors for atherosclerosis uh, causing a ischemic stroke are really the same as those for uh, cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's our lifestyle, what we eat, and our, our inability to uh, get up off our tuchuses uh, that tends to, to lead us down that path. So a huge number of risk factors here. Hypertension, um, it's up there at the top for a reason. It's probably the number one uh, risk factor. Um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease sit all up there very, very closely as well um, because they, those are, are comorbid factors or things that uh, greatly improve or, or increase, I should say, their chances. Um, prior strokes, transient ischemic attacks, hypercholesterolemia or high, high uh, uh, cholesterol. The older you get, greater chance males are higher risk than females. African Americans uh, and uh, Hispanics have twice the risk as the other population as a whole. Uh, family history of, of strokes, hypercoagulative states, so pregnancy, sickle cell, cancers, whatnot, obesity, smoking, AFib, inactivity, cocaine and IV drug use because of some of the impurities that are in there, not to mention they tend to be stimulants that uh, kind of put things into an overdrive. Um, <laughs> excessive alcohol use hormonal contraceptives, and then a history of migraine headaches with an aura. Um, all of those um, have high, high increased uh, risk of stroke. So the pathophysiology, uh, the hemorrhagic stroke due to an aneurysm of the brain or from um, a malformation of the uh, vessels up in the brain. So hypertension and atherosclerosis continue to be risk factors here. Most people with excessively high blood pressures tend to run the risk of the hemorrhagic stroke where as opposed to those who have moderately to mildly high uh, hypertension tend to be more the ischemic. Uh, remember neurologic damage and death is going to occur within four to six minutes um, of either type of stroke. So some terms that go along with it, aphasia means cannot speak, um, they, they actually have a kind of mislabeled there, dysphasia is difficulty or problems with, aphasia is the inability to. Um, we have dysarthria, that's difficulty in speaking due to paralysis or the muscles involved, whereas the a, uh, dysphasia would be uh, the actual mental processing of it and it may be hard to tell the difference. Ataxia is no coordination. <clears throat> Hemianopsia is loss of half of your visual field. 
hemiparesis, weakness on one side of the body, hemiplegia is paralysis on one side of the body. N none of these really are should be, the term may be new to you, but the concept uh, uh, shouldn't be. Common warning signs of a stroke. So things such as sudden numbness or weakness, tingling, confusion, speech difficulties, coordination issues, balance problems, uh, difficulty with their vision or visual disturbance, visual field issues, headaches. Uh, those tend to be the most common. So with a hemorrhagic stroke, uh, these begin with a sudden severe headache, unlike other headaches that they've ever had, and they get progressively worse. Ischemic strokes tend to not have headaches. Uh, I don't like that they put no headache, but tend to, tend to not have headaches. And the signs and symptoms are worse at or near the time of onset. So I think this is, is a very relevant and very key slide here, um, noting that the severe headache and the patient just continues to get worse, sign of a, of a hemorrhagic versus the person with probably no headache, um, and then signs or symptoms that were bad slowly improving. Um, that, I, I think, is, is a huge takeaway here, is that we need to um, pay close attention to that and uh, keep it in mind when we're dealing with the potential stroke patient. TIAs. Transit ischemic attack. Uh, it's a temporary interruption in perfusion. It's usually from uh, atherosclerosis. The uh, <clears throat> the uh, deficit is is uh, limited, so they don't tend to have this for uh, forever. Um, in fact, temporary or transient. Uh, uh, t transient ischemic meaning uh, it comes and it kind of actually goes so in most cases within an hour or two uh, the symptoms are all to mostly resolved but in 24 hours they should be uh, completely resolved and uh, basically ready to you know back to a normal life those that have a TIA are kind of getting a warning flag um, it's kind of like uh, uh, it's like hey here, here's your your one heads up uh, you better go get seen because the chances of you having a good stroke are, are very, of a real stroke are uh, very good. The video on TIA you can watch. Um, stroke treatment. The name of the game for stroke treatment in EMS is on, is uh, recognition, treating some of those symptoms, screening them, and transporting them appropriately to where they need to go. We don't have a lot of the definitive treatments for this person, but we can help start to guide them in the right direction. Uh, so we can take them and we can um, get them to the appropriate hospital that can treat their symptoms. So the, the, the D's of stroke care, uh, detection, somebody's got to recognize it, dispatch, they got to call us, delivery, we pick them up and we get them taken to the appropriate place um, and, and care for their, uh, uh, give them supportive care and maintain their needs as, as, uh, as needed. Um, door, get them transported to a stroke center. Uh, data means that we're getting all the info needed to make an appropriate decision, which is then deciding whether we're going to go with a drug, we're going to go with surgery, we're going to do nothing. Um, giving the drug, sometimes it's systemic. Sometimes it's intra-arterial or right at the spot itself. And then disposition is them getting dismissed either to a, um, um, getting them uh, discharged from the emergency room and transferred into either acute care or, uh, or various critical care units. I, I think there's another one that could potentially be thrown in here, uh, and, and that is their discharge, um, and their discharge meaning that hopefully they're going home to a normal life. Otherwise, they're getting follow-up care via rehab. So, so stroke patient treatment, uh, again, supportive like I've mentioned. Um, oxygen administration, keep their SpO2 of at least 95%. We're not always gunning for 100, but 95. 
uh, manage any hypotension that they may have. And in most cases, remember, it's probably going to be more hypertension than anything. So IV is, is appropriate. Um, stroke treatment, uh, establishing a time of onset. We have about a three to four and a half hour window in order to get this person the drug, uh, the, the TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, to help dissolve their clot. Um, transporting to an appropriate stroke center facility. Not all stroke centers, not all hospitals are, are made the same. That's not to say that rural hospitals can't uh, treat patients with uh, stroke symptoms. They certainly may have the ability to uh, to administer the TPA in that facility and then transport them down to a um, stro uh, stroke center, specialty center. Uh, transport without delay. Manage, be prepared to manage seizures. Remember they're having an issue within their brain, maybe having a seizure. Uh, notify that receiving facility as soon as possible. If you suspect that you're having a stroke, if you can, the moment you walk in the door, if you go, oh crap, this is a stroke, um, it's probably a good idea to let the hospital know, hey, we've got a potential stroke victim here. Uh, that way they can get the appropriate players headed to the hospital. So if they know that there's that very short window in there, and so they may need to get some staff coming in. Um, check their glucose. Remember, altered mental status means check glucose. Look for those patients that have a risk of airway problem because remember, alteration in mental status, alteration in nervous system have the potential for airway issues. Um, treat the hypoxia, but don't over-administer oxygen. Remember, too much oxygen in the body, extra oxygen floating around free in the body causes vasoconstriction. This person does not need less blood flow to their brain. Um, they may be hypertensive. We're not going to probably treat that in the field. Very few systems anymore, EMS systems at the paramedic level, are treating hypertension. And for fibrinolytic therapy to be effective, they have about a three to four and a half hour window. Now they're looking at maybe extending that a little bit, but it, it's currently still being studied and reviewed. So fibrinolytic treatment, inclusion, and exclusion. Things that are absolute must, uh, they absolutely must be having an ischemic stroke um, as opposed to a hemorrhagic stroke. If they have a hemorrhagic stroke, we give them a fibrinolytic, we just accelerated their death. Um, onset of signs or symptoms, three to four and a half hour window. Um, you gotta be at least 18 years of age. Most strokes occur, of course, in the elderly, but they can occur at any time. In fact, um, infants in utero, unborn children, can even have strokes. So. Other things that might exclude them, head trauma or stroke in the previous three months, subarachnoid hemorrhage, arterial puncture in a non-compressible site within the past seven days, previous intracranial hemorrhage bleeding into their brain, blood pressure greater than 185 systolic or 110 diastolic, uh, evidence of an active bleed, and abnormal bleeding as evidenced from laboratory tests when they check their clotting factors. Um, blood glucose of less than 50. There's some other relative exclusion criteria, some other things that they say we're going to be cautious if we're going to, to do this in certain people because this is not, a, it's not without risk. Um, people who get a similar treatment for a heart attack um, I've seen these people cry blood um, they, because it breaks open all these old clots that they have in their body. So um, minor or rapidly improving symptoms, you may want to think twice. Um, seizure at the onset of the symptoms with residual neurologic deficit, major surgery within the past 14 days, um, and in most cases that's going to be yes, we're going to exclude them. Uh, recent GI or urinary tract hemorrhage and an MI within the past three months. Um, all those those things um, have to be taken into consideration because it, it's dangerous. It is dangerous to do this. So, All right, transporting stroke patients, we got to transport them without delay to the most appropriate facility to maximize their chance for improvement. Uh, Stroke centers may or may not be regionally located. Uh, most of the Omaha metro area hospitals boast that they're a stroke center. 
Uh, the problem with this is, is there's not a lot of consistency in what it takes to be a stroke center. Uh, in chest pain centers, it's very, uh, there are very specific guidelines that um, stroke center or that uh, chest pain centers have to, to fit into. However, when we're looking at uh, stroke centers, it's, it's not nearly uh, as well defined. So uh, if you get your, your choice and you're in the Omaha area and you need to take a stroke patient anywhere, uh, the best place to take them would be to the Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, they have by far the most advanced system, uh, the most advanced uh, techniques and procedures that they can do for people with stroke. So uh, where they actually can go in there and basically retrieve the clot and pull the clot out. But, um, air transport may or may not be appropriate depending on your area. And you're going to have to know what your local protocol is. Maybe your local protocol hasn't addressed some of these things. You probably have a protocol for transport to a trauma center. Uh, however, they're looking at maybe even look changing systems and saying we're no longer going to designate trauma centers and chest pain centers and stroke centers. Maybe we're going to designate them as critical emergency centers. Um, so if they can handle strokes and heart attacks and trauma, they may have a different designation. Um, building systems, that's a big thing lately is building these systems to um, maximize outcomes for our patients. Seizures. Uh, seizures are a, a generalized tonic, clonic, or grand mal. Uh, seizure is a, a sign of abnormal electrical impulse. Uh, it usually starts with an aura. And this is the generalized seizure. An aura or kind of a feeling. Sometimes it's a smell. Sometimes it's a taste. Uh, something along those lines. Um, and it usually is you know, seconds to minutes ahead of time. Then they'll have a loss of consciousness, followed by a tonic phase. Tonic retention, clonic is more of a, a relaxed phase. Uh, tonic is when they're kind of doing their, their, their twisting. Uh, clonic is really they're kind of in a relaxation. Uh, they may bounce back and forth between them. And then they have the post-ictal phase in which they're just wiped out. I mean, their whole body has just been um, flooded with uh, electrical activity as well as um, flooded with uh, the various um, various um, hormones and whatnot, and then a huge amount of muscle um, muscle expenditure. So uh, they're really uh, wiped out, and it can last for minutes to hours. It might even wipe them out for the whole day. So a seizure uh, is an abnormal discharge of that neuronal activity. It can cause the, the generalized motor activity. It can be very localized, might be one arm, might be just on their face, uh, could lead to a behavioral change. So um, the uh, behavioral change can sometimes just be the patient looks like they're kind of uh, zoning out and they can't... Uh, can't be snapped out of it. So, people have been uh, claimed to have ADD uh, before and, and uh, weren't able to uh, pay attention. Well, and come to find out, they had a seizure disorder. Um, some underlying causes. Typically, it is one of two major issues: epilepsy or a fever. Fevers are very common in small children. Epilepsy tends to be more common in the older populations. Uh, epilepsy is really kind of a diagnosis of exclusion where the patient is, uh, they have seizures, they find the activity, but they really don't have a good, um, they really don't have a good explanation otherwise why the, uh, uh, the patient is, is exhibiting the signs that they're, they are. So, um, toxins or drugs can cause them. Metabolic disorders can, can cause them as well. So say diabetes, um, trauma, stroke, tumors, all those things in the brain can certainly cause it to have some short circuits and some haywires going on. Uh, the key piece of information on seizure uh, is uh, whether or not they have a history. Now there are some people who will have one seizure in their life ever and that's it. In many cases, that's a, a 
pediatric patient who has a little febrile seizure from getting sick. Um, but those people who have a repetitive seizure history, it usually um, leads us down the diagnosis of, a, of epilepsy. So we have some seizures which are characterized as, as tonic-clonic versus absence. They're in the generalized seizure. So um, uh, it's not specific to a certain body part, although the absence seizure would, would appear to be. Uh, the tonic clonic, this is the this is grand mal, this is the full body flopping around has a postictal state. Whereas the absence seizure, uh, they can appear as, as simply staring off or daydreaming and you just can't get their attention. You may also have a partial seizure, uh, which only focuses on one specific area of their brain. Could be something like um, arms, legs, um, part of their face. Uh, they have some uh, motor issues. They may have just sensory issues. Uh, they also have complex partial seizures. So these are the ones that have an aura that they knew were coming on, but it doesn't affect their entire body. Uh, patients often become uh, injured during the seizure, uh, particularly if it's a generalized seizure in which uh, they lose most of their faculties and their control can easily become hypoxic, they can become acidotic, they can suffer airway problems, they can...